First off, thank you for coming. Um, I see some familiar faces. I see some new faces. This seems to have been an awesome word camp so far. So I hope you guys have been having fun. And hopefully this presentation will continue to be fun. Um, we, as you can tell from the title slide, we're going to talk about professional WordPress development practices. Now, to be clear, these things are not written in stone. This is not the gospel of how to write software using WordPress or how to develop with WordPress. These are just uh, things that many of us in the development community use, that we employ, that we do, and um, that we found successful. There may be differences that you have. There may this may be the exact same thing that you do. I don't know. But there will be room for questions, and we'll talk all about that uh, later in the presentation. So, um, okay. So, with that said, before I get started, I actually like to talk a little bit about me so you have some background as to why I am up here talking about any of this rather than just rambling on about, you know, WordPress, and this is what you should do because I think it sounds cool. Um, as you can tell, hopefully from the schedule and from this ridiculous introduction, my name is Tom, and I'm self-employed. My company's name is Pressware because I, though I do some theme development, largely plug-in development, I really like building software on top of WordPress. So take WordPress, take software, you get Pressware. So creative. Um, I also blog daily at TomMcFarland.com. It's predominantly about applying software engineering techniques or various aspects of writing WordPress code. And I try to follow uh, and try to kind of push um, best practices, WordPress coding standards, all of that. Uh, the cool thing is about blogging, in case those of you who haven't done it, is that when you do it, you get some really good pushback in the comments that can help in turn educate you. So if you're not doing it and you think, well, what would I blog about? Blog about what you're doing in WordPress and, and share it on Twitter, share it on your social networks, whatever. I have been married to my high school sweetheart for eight years this April. I uh, absolutely adore her. We have now two beautiful daughters who I adore them as well. We have two crazy terrier mutts that we've had since we were married three months. We went looking just to go look at dogs, then we found one, and then one had a sister, and then I came home with two 10-week-old puppies and um, had to, in our apartment, our first apartment, um, had, there, there went my deposit fee because the carpet and the molding was all gone. Um, everything that I do is a combination of passion for WordPress and also for taking care of my family. I am incredibly lucky that I get to do both of those. I'm happy with what I do and it, it helps make a living and provide for my family. Now, we're gonna be, I was gonna say we're gonna be together for the next hour, but it's the second day of work, or third day since you've been here since Friday. So we've been together for the majority of the weekend. Um, I don't wanna be the buzzkill for the weekend. So we're gonna try to make this as fun as possible. Um, you can, I don't have this, this bottom, um, I don't have this bottom uh, lower, normally it's a lower third, it's more like a lower 16th here on this slide. You can find me on Twitter at Tom McFarlane, my blog is Tom McFarlane, my company is Pressware.co, and then I recently launched, and I'm in the process of continuing to launch, some plugins specifically for bloggers, not programmers, not tech types, but for bloggers at PresswarePlugins.com. But... The purpose of this talk is that I believe there are a better way to build solutions using WordPress. And this can be generalized for themes, plugins, software. This can be generalized to if you're someone who is maintaining code or if you're a beginner or an intermediate um, or even an advanced user. However, I will say here at the head of the talk that this talk is geared towards beginners and um, intermediates um, because uh, there's a lot of mistakes that you experience early in your career, and if I can help shortcut some of those, or shortcut some of those, then I will feel like this presentation has done its job. So throughout the presentation, what we're going to cover are what I call three environments, which uh, we will talk about in just a minute. We'll talk about why they matter and how they help us. But when you look at one and two, it's, that seems to go hand in hand. There's three environments, why do they matter? But the question of how do they help us? 
because if you're I don't, I don't even want to say if you're self-employed, but if, this, if you do WordPress as a side project, uh, if it's a hobby, if you do anything for anyone else, then, you want, then, then you're responsible for <coughs> building the solution, managing the project. You're responsible possibly for marketing. I mean, any hats that you can throw out regarding to running a business, you're responsible for, and that's a lot. And I can't speak to all of them but I'm gonna to try to speak to a number of them, especially project management. Now, um, ultimately what I wanna be able to show by the end of the talk, in addition to staging environments and related tools, things like that, um, or development environments rather, is how you can increase your productivity with a workflow, a certain type of workflow, how you can increase your client's experience because, I mean, <laughs> You go on the web and you see websites like Clients from Hell, and you get on Twitter and you see people complaining about their clients. But I think that's, I mean, yeah, clients can be rough, but it's a two-way relationship. And if you dislike all of your clients or the majority of your clients, maybe there's something about your process that's wrong with you. And that's not saying you're a bad person. That's just saying if every project you do, you have a complaint about what's the common denominator. So let's try to fix that. Um, and I also want to help you become a better developer because you come to WordPress, you, or WordCamp, you come to a, the, the developer track, you want to walk away hopefully being armed with something better to help you than walking away being like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with this information. So before we get started, I have some questions to ask you. You can raise your hand or you can opt to keep them low or not raise them, it doesn't matter. There's no wrong answer, but it's going to help tailor how I proceed with certain points throughout the rest of the talk. So first, the questions are already on the screen. I don't do the fancy animations. Um, so, but first I do wanna know, do you build sites? Awesome, 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 awesome. Um, do you maintain code, and by maintaining code, I mean either yours or you've inherited code from someone else that you're now responsible for maintaining? Wow, awesome. All right, <clears throat> how many of you in here use version control? Okay, good, good. For those of you that don't, no big deal, we're gonna talk about it. Um, and how many of you in here, in addition to version control, use some type of deployment software that's hooked up to your version control? Okay, cool. We're going to talk about all of those and uh, at a high level, I'm going to mention some tools for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with it, so don't be intimidated. And I'm not going to have a lot of uh, code and fancy configuration scripts or anything like that. Um, that's that's to, to, to research on your own and to see what's out there. So I wanna, I'm going to lay out what's out there and then you can go and explore. So. Uh, lastly, for those of you who have heard me speak at previous WordCamps or at other meetups, you know that I'm pretty laid back about, hey, interrupt me, ask questions as the presentation goes on. But for this particular talk, please hold all questions and comments until the end because I want to get through um, everything and then try to answer everything during the allotted time at the end. And there will be a lot of time at the end. So first, we are going to talk about the three environments. You have heard of these most likely in one of two ways, development staging or production, or maybe uh, local testing and live. And if you haven't, that's okay, because we are going to talk about all three of them right now. Now development, this or, or uh, development or local, this happens on your local machine. This is on your laptop, this is on your desktop. And it is supposed to mirror, or it should mirror, your staging and production environment. Now, what does that mean? So <clears throat> let's say that your client or your project is going to be running on a traditional LAMP stack. Uh, so Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. If, you're, if you have a Windows laptop or you have a Mac, I mean, clearly, don't worry about the Linux part. But you, I highly, highly recommend that you try to create as much uh, parity between your machine and what's going on staging and what's set up in production. Because uh, when you deploy code to staging, then it's going to save you debugging headaches. Because if you have one environment on your machine and then staging has one environment, maybe it's running um, 
Nginx, which is another great web server. I'm using Apache as an example. Either one of those, cool. Uh, MySQL or an alternative database. And, uh, and, and then PHP. And maybe, maybe you're going to be able to run on PHP 7. If so, it's awesome. PHP 7 gives massive performance improvements. But if you're on PHP 6, I mean 5.6, no big deal. And then um, the same is true for production. We'll talk a little bit about that in more detail in just a minute. But development slash local, this is where development starts. Now, when you begin a project, uh, some people have a tendency to say, okay, I have WordPress installed on my machine, and I have my web server installed, and I have my database, and I have PHP installed, and I am ready to go. And then they get project number two, and they get project number three, and they get project number four, but they've only got one installation of WordPress. So every project they've ever worked on is living on one installation of WordPress. But when you release a project for your client, you're not releasing one installation of WordPress plus all three or four other projects you've worked on. You're releasing one installation of WordPress and their project. So every time you get a new project, you should have one installation of WordPress for that project. You should have whatever set of plugins you're going to be using for that project. You should have whatever configuration you're going to be using for that project. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar with setting up uh, host names, or um, you have, uh, I believe Windows calls it the host file, then you want to, I urge you uh, to have a unique domain for each site. So you're almost creating a sandbox for each project. And this way, when your client comes to you, when client A comes to you and says, hey, how are things going? Can we do a deployment to staging so I can see how things are going? You say, if that's going, if that matches our project management schedule, um, but I'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, but you say, yeah, sure, no problem. And you can deploy that entire directory and you're, and, and you're good to go. You don't have to worry about like opening up an FTP client and figuring out, oh gosh, what is it I'm supposed to be deploying for this one person? And you've got this massive stack of notes and it's a pain. And we don't want that. So um, you want to give each project its own unique WordPress installation uh, database and uh, you want to manage everything in its own uh, proverbial sandbox. So what is staging? Staging one is for deployments. This is also also the staging environment is sometimes referred to as test. It is accessible by you and it is accessible by your client. If you want it accessible by the public, have at it. But oftentimes um, when you deploy you want to make sure that you have your uh, WordPress installation checked so that um, search engines will not index it. Secondly, this is a place where you can deploy code and it's for testing only. That means you can go in and you can put whatever test data you want to. If you want to copy and paste a bunch of Lorem Ipsum text or Samuel J, what is it, or Samuel L. Jackson Ipsum text in there, go for it. If you want to put pictures of kittens or if you want to put pictures of something from Star Wars, go for it. Whatever it is that helps you test and helps your client test the solution that you're building for them can go into staging. Um, this, is, this is where you are testing various milestones, various tasks. Again, all stuff we're going to talk about in a little bit. And then, oh man, I totally borked the database. All, everything's gone. It's for testing only. The data's gone. So what? You were putting Samuel L. Jackson quotes in there. Do you really care that you lost it? So, but what it should do is help you uh, present what you've built for the client, making sure that it's one-to-one -one with the requirements. Now, don't modify code live on this server. You need to have a process. You modify code in development. You don't modify code in test. You test in test. So if something is wrong uh, on, or if something needs to be changed on the staging server, don't edit it there because then you have to work backwards and pull staging down into development. So you've created this weird cycle of now how you're inter interacting with your various environments. So instead, um, and by the way, when people talk about cowboy coding, that is what they mean by, by uh, writing code live on the server. Just, just don't, just don't do it. Um, because if, if they're not happy, if, if, if the client is testing something on the staging environment and it's already broken and then you go to cowboy code, 
<laughs> and you break something else in staging, you can't do a deployment from development because you're going to deploy something that they already didn't like and you didn't fix anything. So you've, you get this huge mess of code spread out across a variety of environments. Just development is for writing code. Staging is for deployments and testing. Production, or live, is for the live site. This is for code deployments and users. Now maybe you are running a blog and you get 100 users a day, but maybe you and a designer and one other developer are, or 100 visitors a day, maybe you, a developer, and a designer are all working on your blog. That is three different people, all of whom are contributing some type of code to your code base. It needs to be, in, uh, it needs to be done on development, it needs to be managed in source control, which we'll talk about a little bit in just a minute. And then it needs to go out and be, and then when it deploys, after it passes uh, testing, it gets deployed to production. This is where people are interacting with your site. You should never make live changes in production. If you want to mess around doing that in staging, that's your call. I don't recommend it. But don't do it on production. People are interacting with your site. If you change something and then they click a link and all of a sudden they get the white screen, man, your site went from, hey, I'm using this. This is kind of cool that the site's gone. Don't just don't do that. And this is this, um, the production environment also, it should never include test content. It's one thing to, in staging, to have fun with it and to put whatever kind of pictures up and whatever kind of language and test data up, but you don't want your live production to be mingled or you don't want your production environment to be mingled with your own blog post or if you don't want your application to have sample data of various characters from your favorite episode or your favorite novel of Game of Thrones, you don't want Frodo Baggins showing up as some user on your, on your production site. Uh, so you don't deploy test content and never deploy untested code. If it has not passed staging, then it should never go to production because how do you know that it works? But this still raises the question of deploying code. That is, how do you send your code from your machine or from whatever remote machine you have to staging and to production? Now, this is where we start getting into version control and deployment tools. And there have been some fantastic talks by some other people this weekend. Um, one of them was by Evan yesterday, I think. Yeah, Evan, raise your hand. It, when it's on WordPress TV, I highly recommend checking it out, especially if you're managing a, um, a fleet of servers or a rack of servers or whatever additive you want to use. Um, but we've, we, we've covered the environments and we've covered the purpose of them, but we haven't actually talked about how do we get it from point A to point B. This is where it depends on your experience. Beginners are going to be used to one way. Intermediate developers and ex more experienced developers will be used to another way. Don't be intimidated by what you may not know in what we're about to talk about. Instead, make notes, treat it as a learning experience because every single person, like no one started out just knowing how to use version control. No one just sat down on the computer and was like, yeah, I got this. Um, no one sat down and said, I should have three environments. That seems to make a lot of sense, and I'm so good because I just figured that out. No one does that. Everyone has learned this. And so if today you're just now learning it, awesome. Welcome to the club. Um, but first, let's talk about deployments via FTP. Uh, I almost did a slide about writing code in the editor that's built into WordPress, but I feel like I can summarize it in one statement. Just don't. <laughs> don't do it. Um, if you have your development environment set up, the first place that most people start is that they will begin deploying their code via FTP. And that is a great first step because what you're learning is, hey, here's my development machine. Here's a remote machine. I see how WordPress is structured here, and I know what files I need to move from place to place. And if you're working on small projects, it's especially uh, a really good way to learn. But um, you should, I, I still think that it's okay to have your, or I still think you should have your staging and production, but here's where the, it gets a little foggy. Uh, you now have three environments and you're having to figure out some way to track what have I deployed via FTP from my local machine to my staging environment. And then 
staging's passed off, so I've now FTP things over to production, but I'm not, I can look at the dates, I guess, and see when they changed, but I don't know what version is on staging, I don't know what version's on production, and I don't, I'm not really sure what version, or I'm not sure what part of uh, the project or which branch of source code I'm, I'm working on in development. And so you can see how this can snowball out of control really fast. And maybe you get mixed up, maybe you select the wrong shortcut in your FTP client and your Samuel L. Jackson with the Star Wars pictures is now on production and your bloggers or, or your visitors who are using your application have no clue what you're doing uh, or what they're seeing or reading. So if you want to grow in this area, you need additional tools. And that is where version control and deployment tools come into play. First, version control. If you haven't heard of it at all, totally cool. You've probably also heard to it as referred to as uh, source code control. Um, they're synonyms, but version control seems to be the one that most people are using nowadays. And what version control is, is if you are writing a WordPress theme or you're writing a WordPress plugin, you've probably seen something in the codex about subversion. Now, those repositories on WordPress.org are powered by subversion. That's one way to handle version control. And what version control does is you say, let's say you're working with subversion. You say, hey, subversion, I've got a project in this directory. I'm going to be working in this directory. Watch all the files in here. And then what happens, it's kind of magical um, before you begin peeling back the layers, is it will watch every single change you make to a file. So when you're ready to deploy, you see a nice list of the files that you touched. And then you can say, these are the files I need to deploy. And then once you have that group of files, you can, in subversion, they call them tags. You can create a tag. This is version 0.1 or 0.1.0, .0, and then you can deploy that. And then as you continue to create these changes and you see these changes in files that you have, you can then tag them with a version, send them out to your staging environment or your production environment, and, and be good to go. Because you're now, now you're not scrambling through your notebook and looking at file dates, trying to figure out, what did I deploy when and to where and who's viewing what and did they sign off on it? All that, mm -mm. You can automate this. And so uh, the, other the other version control system that you've probably heard of is Git. And many of you have probably heard of it mostly from GitHub. Now, GitHub gets its name because it's an entire site slash web app built on the source control system of Git. And Git works differently than Subversion. The nuances of how they work is, are beyond the scope of this talk. But if you want to release, uh, well, when GitHub came out, they, their big thing was we're social coding because everything's got to be social now. If you can't follow a person on a website, then that website sucks, right? Like, why does everything have to, why you got to follow everybody? But anyway, I digress. Um, GitHub is actually a really amazing website, and you can follow some incredible projects. Like, I mean, some of the stuff that you see that's out there that you like, maybe it's, it's apps for, uh, or maybe it's plugins, maybe it's various apps for your computer. If they're on GitHub, you can follow them. You can watch what people are doing. That is really cool. But what Git does is it allow, it's another way of saying, hey, um, instead of talking to Subversion, you say, hey, Git, <coughs> don't tell Subversion, but I'm choosing you to watch my files because I like you better. And then you say, uh, and then it continues to watch your files. And then you say, okay, I'm ready to commit these files so that I can push them out to staging or production. And there's one extra step that Git does that Subversion doesn't, and that is you can do a commit before you do a push. So this means you can have what's called a change set. So let's say you change five files. You say, okay, I have implemented this feature and it has touched these five files. I'm gonna commit these, but they're not actually, they haven't actually gone out to a remote machine yet. So you continue to work on some features, you create a few more commits or a few more change sets, and then you push. And when you push, you're pushing it out to the remote machine. And then everyone who's following your project can see what was just pushed. Um, they can see what files, what what files went in, what code was changed, and then they can see uh, do I want to download this version or not. And just like Subversion, you can tag the releases. So when you say, okay, I am ready to tag this as version 1.0.0, .0 .0, 
then you can do that. And you can tell people through your README file or through the home pro project homepage, whatever, you can say, follow, th this is where, you know, the development will always be in this um, branch. And don't let the, don't let the vernacular um, confuse you. GitHub has a glossary, go literally Google GitHub glossary. It'll define all these terms for you. Um, and you can say, if you really want a stable version, look under my tags, and these are the ones that you should be using. But if you want to live on the edge, Here's where you can check stuff out. But if it breaks your site, it's your fault. It's not mine because this is what you downloaded, and I warned you. Okay, so there's one more major advantage that version control breaks, or version control offers, and it doesn't matter which system you choose. Uh, that's if you, let's say that you test something in staging, and then your client tests something in staging, and they sign off, and they say, this looks great. It works exactly as expected. So you roll it out of production, and then you get a user who's really curious or they don't know what they're doing, and they stumble across a bug. They, they click a sequence of things, or they navigate somewhere they shouldn't. Maybe you're getting error logs. Maybe something breaks. I don't know how your monitoring is set up, but you get an email or 40 emails or 120 emails saying, this isn't working. I can't do whatever it is you promised me I could do, and I want my money back. And you reply and say, I haven't charged you anything yet. And then you say, um, <laughs> you say, uh, okay, thank you for bringing this to my attention. We'll have this fixed ASAP. And ASAP, when you have, when you have version control and deployment tools set up, ASAP can be freaking fast because you have a history of everything you've ever done. So you can initiate a rollback to the last version that you know was working. So you tell your de deployment tool, hey, roll back to this version. It'll say, okay. Give it a few seconds or a few minutes, depending on how large your project is. Site stays up, code rolls back, you email, you send off 120 emails and say, thank you for bringing it to my attention. This has been fixed. Love you guys. Thanks. And they go back to their site and they're happy. You don't know, you don't owe anyone any money that they never had in the first place. And then you can go back and enter in some bug reports and begin managing your project a little bit better. Now, this still raises a question about databases because you know that WordPress is a database-backed web app. Everything is stored, or almost everything is stored in the database, and that's what drives when you're putting information in and you're pulling information out. It's all stored in the database. So how do you handle databases? And this is a question, if you were to Google or go to Stack Overflow or any of these other sites, you could ask the question, do I or how do I version control my database? Some people will say that you should. Some people will say that you shouldn't. I'm not going to take a stance on that today. Um, it depends on your project, and it depends on how technically savvy you are with your development chops at this point. So, But what instead, I'm going to recommend two solutions for being able to deploy your database from development to uh, staging into production. The first one, if you have a development workflow, or I'm sorry, a development environment set up on your local machine, odds are you have a copy of what's called PHP My Admin. It's a mouthful. It is a web application, and it allows you to see all of the databases on your system. And remember, you should, if you have multiple WordPress projects, you should have multiple databases. And it allows you to export the entire database. Literally, it'll come out in one .sql file. <clears throat> and then you hop over to your staging environment or your production environment, and you have PHP My Admin installed, and you can click on import. And then you can import the file you just exported. But there are some caveats to this, the least of which is not the user interface of PHP My Admin. <laughs> um, that might, I digress. Uh, the, you have set up on your local machine uh, dev.myproject.com and you import that database into staging or into production. All of your links, all of your homepage, all of your articles, all of the custom post types, whatever it is you have set up, they're all going to be based around dev.mysite.com. So you go to staging and you're like, none of these links work. I can't even get the site to load. Why isn't it loading at you know, test.staging.net? And that's because you, all, the, all, the, um, all of the URLs are wrong. Now, there are tools in which you can go through and uh, 
look for these strings, there are plugins rather, I should say, that you can install and say, hey, go through, look for these strings, change them to this. It's cumbersome, and the way those plugins work do leave room for margin of error. It may look like everything's working smoothly, but I, I don't want to guarantee, but 99% sure that there's going to be a buried link or a buried something in there that you won't be able to access, and your users are going to find it. So if you're really savvy with databases and you've got a handle on, on, on SQL and you know what you're doing, have at it. Now this next thing, I'm going to WP Migrate DB Pro, a disclaimer. I'm not being paid to promote this plugin. It is a premium plugin. Uh, I love it. It is worth every cent. You can probably recoup the cost in one project. And if you can't, then in your proposal or in your estimate or however you communicate with your projects, just bump the price up by the price of that plugin and you're taken care of. <laughs> but here's, here's how it works. It's a WordPress plugin that you install. You say, hey, I'll, and then you install it on, you install it on development, and then you install it on staging, and you can install it on production. And depending on how you want to, where you want to move your data from, where you want to move your data to, you can tell the plugin, I want to move, uh, it'll give you a URL with a unique string, and you just paste it, and you say, okay, I'm going to pull the database from staging, and I'm going to move it into production. And uh, then it'll say, and this is where the awesome part is. It'll say, replace all of the URLs that are dev.mysite.com. It will replace them with whatever URL you have, you know, like test.mysite.net. Um, I should be more creative with these URLs, but uh, I apologize. Um, and the other thing is that it will also create backups of your database in case something goes wrong. And you can be moving copies of your database upstream and downstream. It takes the pain out of it. It works within the WordPress admin. It gives you a progress bar and tells you what tables it's working on. It creates a backup. It, it works within the WordPress dashboard. It looks like it's part of WordPress. There's no uh, nasty user interface things. Like It's clear. The documentation is great. The support team is great. If you're not, if you're not a... Uh, SQL expert or you just don't like the way PHP my admin looks I don't blame you but I highly recommend this plugin so um, and you can find this the company behind it is uh, this will be good for those of you who like the Walking Dead or any of those old zombie flicks from the 80s uh, deliciousbrains.com that's the company behind it I don't know whose brains they ate I don't know why they would be delicious but anyway moving on we have improving project management, and the whole point of this is, as you can see, streamlining your workflow and keeping clients happy, because who likes clients that are just, it's like Monday every day of the week, oh, I got an email from this person. I don't want, oh, God, this, I wish this person would go away. Why did I estimate this project? It doesn't have to be that way, I promise. Um, now, some people are going to be harder to work with than other people because we all have different personalities, but that doesn't mean we can't try to maximize the amount of uh, happiness that we can experience in our projects. Now, the thing about, especially if you're doing this as a hobby or self-employed, you're not just developer, you're also the project manager. And I mean this in a good way. Some people are like, you know, thank God I have a project manager or... I don't want to take on the role of project manager. Well, sometimes if you're self-employed, if you're running your own shop, you need to be a project manager because your clients need to know what's going on. And so <clears throat> imagine for a minute if you had the opportunity to be given some advice on or given a book or a handout or whatever on ways to make your clients happier so that your Tuesday or your Wednesday or your Friday doesn't feel like a Monday because of a nasty email or a disappointing email or whatever, imagine what that would feel like. So I'm going to share some things that I have learned over the past half a decade, six years or so. And these things are not prescriptive because, again, everyone has a different personality. I'm going to share at a high level as to how I approach this kind of stuff and adapt it as you need, ignore it if you want to, um, 
or borrow it completely. Uh, first, this may change or require this may change how you are currently managing your workflow for project management. Um, this may spur you to create a workflow for project management, and this may have you raise your hand and tell me, "Man, your project management workflow is something I would never do, and I don't even think you should be doing it." So I'm open to everything at, after the talk. But anyway, so here is my approach. After the after we've after the client and I have talked and we've done, you know, as they say, the discovery phase, which is fancy for, "Hey, what do you need built?" And then you say, or, and then you've done requirements, which is, "This is what you say you need. Here's what I promise to deliver at this price." I then set up my development environment, which means a single installation of WordPress, a unique host name, and then if I need plugins or if I need a theme, which depending on the nature of your work, you may or may not need. It doesn't matter. Then I take the requirements document <coughs> and, I, and, I, and I spend some time with it because, I mean, I need to know what I'm building, but uh, most of the time the requirements document is still at a really high level. And you've got to drill down and to say, okay, this requirement, th this bullet point, or this first three bullet points, these things actually would require, hmm, the first one would require three tasks. So write out what those three tasks are. And then the second bullet point, repeat the process. And the third point, repeat the process. And then use some type of software or some type of document, or even, even if it's just email, let the client know, here is how I'm going to be building your project. And I will give you updates when each milestone is finished. And a milestone is defined as a collection of tasks. You don't want to necessarily bug someone when you've made a small <coughs> CSS change or introduced a single JavaScript file. That's a little overkill. But when you've checked off five tasks and it solves one of the main bullet points in the requirements, that's where you would want to tag something in your version control, launch it to staging, and say, OK, go check this out. Here's what's done. Best case scenario, clients were like, yeah, you nailed it. That is awesome. Worst case, it, or maybe middle of the road case, it looks great, but what I meant was, and worst case is, this isn't what I asked for. What I said was, and then you show them the requirements document. Well, that's what you, that's what you said. Um, so let's talk a little bit about it. This is what you said, but there was clearly a misunderstanding on my part because now you have a relationship with the client. You want to have a good relationship with the client. It's okay to own the miscommunication. If they said something, it's not their fault that they did not get the jargon right. So they're not the technical person on the project. You are. So own the miscommunication. Say, I'm sorry that I misunderstood you, and then move forward from there. They'll clarify then you double or triple or quadruple check, and they'll, yeah, that's exactly what it is I want. Okay, give me you know, X number of days. You know how well or and how fast you work and can build something. So you go and then you, you reiterate on this particular milestone. You launch it, you show it to them, and they say, that's what I wanted, good job. So then you move on to the next milestone. And then you move on to the next milestone, and you move on to the next milestone. And this process repeats throughout however many milestones you've defined. If you have a 29 milestone project, it's probably too large of a project for a small team. If you're in the enterprise, that's something different. But if, you're, if you've got 29 milestones, what you need to do is break that up and say, hey, this is what I think, you know, these first five, six, seven milestones, this is version one. Everything after this, it's not that it's not important, but we've got to lay the foundation on which to scale up, on which to build on top of. So let's focus on these first. Um, you can then invoice for this first version so you get paid a little bit early, uh, which is always nice. But um, when you outline the process to your client, what you're doing is you're helping to facilitate small feedback loops. Feedback loops, another phrase that's kind of a buzzword in the industry, and all it means is how, how frequently are you talking to your client? So a small feedback loop is it's, it's Monday morning and you're starting work on, a, on, on the project. Or maybe it's Tuesday. I'm just being arbitrary here. And then in three days, you've got, your, you've got the first milestone completed. So you're like, hey, client, this is done. It's in stage and you can check it out here. Let me know what you think. And they get back to you and then they either like it or they don't, and there's some small tweaks. So you go off and you make them, and you come back and you say, hey, client, I've made the tweaks. What do you think? And they like it. 
Then you can move forward to the next milestone and you repeat that process over and over until the end of the project. And if it sounds rote and it sounds boring, here's what the alternative is. The client comes to you and says, this is what I want. And you say, great, sounds good. So you start work on Monday, first Monday in April, and then you step all the way over here. Hey client, you emailed me, I started back in April, it's the end of June, I've got something to show you. And they look at it and they don't know where to begin with telling you, with giving you your feedback. Well, I really like the design that was done here for the header. The background isn't all what I envisioned. The functionality when you click on this widget is nothing that we spoke of. I don't know why you have a calendar here. Where are my controls in the admin? I thought I was supposed to have some custom capabilities for this user role. And why is, are you using that font? I specifically said not to use that font. That is a long feedback loop. What a, and then now you've taken a project that's gone from April to June, which could have been done a lot faster had you been having smaller feedback loops and increased your, yet another buzzword, your velocity, how fast you are getting things done. So small feedback loops, whatever, whatever you take away from project management, I, I don't care what tools you use. A lot of people like Basecamp. I use one called Freedcamp. Um, there are, I don't care if you use a Google spreadsheet. I don't care if you use a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. I don't even care if you just use email. Just have a process for your clients because it really, really, really makes a difference. And they want to know what's going on because how I many, when you go to a place and someone's working on something for you, isn't it kind of like this black box thing like, what are they doing exactly? I mean, if it's something you don't care about, that's one thing, but if it's something specifically tailored for you, you kind of want to know what they're doing. So you get the itemized list, you know, and you appreciate that because you can see and you can talk about each thing they did. And that is the analogy for this. So you've gotten to the middle of May because you use, for, you use short feedback loops or you're still working until June and you're not done yet. But anyway, you're done at some point in the middle of the summer. Maybe you're even bleeding over into the fall. I'm sorry if that happens to you, but you did it to yourself. And you then deploy to production. You have finished version one or version two or whatever. Your client's happy. You have more milestones in the pipeline. They trust you because of the way that you have handled the project with your staging environments. They trust you because of the way that you have communicated with them. They trust you because you have owned the fact that when there was a misunderstanding, it was something on your part and they love what they see out there right now. And so they're ready to get started on the next part. So thank you for listening. I know that was a lot of information at first. I am completely open to comments, questions, feedback, clarity. Anything you guys and girls want to ask, I am completely open to. So I think we have 20 minutes by my clock. So, um, so let's, let's talk. Uh, yes. It's called Freed Camp. It's, uh, it's free. Um, Base Camp is great. I'm not harsh on that, but it is, it is um, like if you're starting out and you're really budgeting every dollar, Base Camp's expensive. Um, and uh, Freed Camp is an alternative that, uh, I mean, you can tell who they're competing against just on the name alone. But I personally like the way that they organize projects and tasks and calendars and things like that and you can the add-ons to purchase like if you want google drive storage it's like two dollars like it's way cheaper than what some of the alternatives are and you can use it for even personal they have a the, they're working on a mobile app but their site is built um incredibly well so that you can just bookmark it add it to your home screen and it works great yeah Um, you, they have uh, user roles. So what you can do is you can add people but give them restricted permissions. And um, if you want to do the client side, which is a really cool feature of Basecamp, I admit, like with Freedcamp, what you're able to do, um, if, you, if you really wanted to create strong lines of distinction is have like your, your team's private side of the project and then create a separate public project that you invite them to. So there's some ways to work, yeah, Julian. I just wanted to mention, if you like the workflow stuff, I'm going to be sharing some Asana stuff, too. I use Asana mm. for project management. It's just my whole process about workflow. So if you like, that's one, yeah. It's at 1 o'clock right after lunch.
and I, I've known Julian for a couple of years. If you have a chance to listen to his talk, go. Um, Russell. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> this, I'd add, I'd, I would add kind of a caveat to here based on how technical your, uh, your client is. Um, when you have a project management tool, some of them will let you do, depending on which ones you use, um, they will automatically notify or they can notify your customers or your users when something has gone out and is ready to be checked. Um, it is an automated message, so it sounds kind of like robo message. Um, then there's other deployment tools. You can set per, you can set I, uh, like web hooks and say, hey, ping this Slack channel or ping this mail service and let them know this deployment has gone out. Um, and then on the far end of the spectrum, the manual end is you email them. And if they're if they're more on the technical side, they probably won't mind receiving the automated messages. But if they're someone who they know what the what you can do with the web, but they're very non-technical, sometimes a personal email is the best. And yeah, it's we want to automate all the things because that's like that's why we write code. Um, but uh, sometimes having that personal interaction goes a long way with certain types of people. So um, read the read the documentation for whatever tool you use. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you ever develop on more than one machine? Uh, I used to, and um, I, I, I have two machines. I don't like having two machines. For and I've, I've tried to simplify over the years to help me focus more. Um, but when it comes to um, testing, absolutely. Yeah. When it comes to development, yes and no. Um, I try to do all of my development on one, but if I'm taking a trip and I'm going to take a lighter machine, Yes, I will. But what I do is I make sure that the machines are set up almost identically, and then I will pull. I will do a checkout of the code from version control, uh -huh. and I will just work on that machine and push it back up. Okay. And when I get back home, I'll pull it down, and so there's I'm all my code. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked in environments before where the resource allocation is a bit different, where mm -hmm. all of the resources were on the spectrum and like 10% of the resources were on the staging. Yeah. So the effect was that you know the production site was running normal speed. The staging site was it would take like 30 seconds to load a, a cache page and about yeah. three minutes to load a non-cache page. Is yeah. that a common practice? Or is there a way to uh, it, it, yeah. I'd love to have a... If you want to speak to it? I, I'll, I'll add my answer in a minute. But okay. Well, obviously, like what he said, the optimal like thing is to have as close as parity as you can. And Evan gave a really good talk on using some like principle to deploy your servers. But in my experience, if something's slow on staging, it's never going to make it to live. So your client's going to want to make sure for production for your mm -hmm. client, like. I think the best thing to do is to set up, if, if you're going that hardcore, like the, the stuff, it makes sense to just go all the way. Whatever you're running locally needs to also be, if you can, like if it's on Vagrant or whatever, it also needs to be the exact same thing on staging and on production. And then you don't run into those weird bottlenecks when you start launching things. It's a little bit more expensive, but if you have a client that's like that worried about those two differences, it makes the most amount of sense to have as much parity as you can. Yeah. And that... I'll offer an alternative to that, and it really, but it really does depend on the client. But I will say that for a number of projects, I will use a cheap web host that just offers Apache MySQL and PHP or whatever configuration I need, and um, and I will use that for staging, and I will use a subset of information in the database for caching. I mean, I don't. I don't know if you need to have caching in test. I mean, you can talk to the client about that. That, that to me, is one of those 
Like this is like once it comes out of the show, like once it's on the showroom, it'll have that. But in testing, you're more worried about features, and you're more worried about. Um, and if, if if for whatever reason you're building speed is a feature, then yeah, absolutely, you want to have that close parity. Um, and I know people generally say speed is a feature, and it is. But when you're testing something, you're more worried about is this feature working as I expect? Can the user or my users accomplish whatever it is I want them to accomplish on a site? And then. Um, and the reason I, I mentioned like cheap web hosting is because uh, it's it, it, it's cheap and and there are diamond li almost literally a diamond dozen that are out there that you can choose from. Now for production, that's where I think having uh, go go w with cost go all out. If you're really technically savvy, um, DigitalOcean is something that I think you should check out because they. I mean, I can't say enough good things about them, but it does require a bit of um, knowledge on con handling what are known as droplets and, 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 and data centers and um, operating systems and things like that. So I know that's a long-winded answer, but hopefully you kind of got two sides of what to expect. I have used Server Pilot. And for those of you who are interested or have heard of DigitalOcean and aren't sure what to, if you want to get used to it or not, um, Server Pilot is a really great piece of software that will ease you into DigitalOcean. So what you do is you go to DigitalOcean, you create uh, a droplet, to, and a droplet is basically um, a virtual machine in which your site is running. You get FTP access, you get shell access, you get all of that stuff. You can install, um, I mean, you'll, you have to, if you want to install SSL certificates, you need to, you'll have to do it on your own. But if you want to avoid some of server administration, uh, server administration, serverpilot.io, if you just tell it some information about your droplet, it'll go in, it will set up everything for you, uh, and then you're ready to roll. So it's a good intermediary step. But if you want to use, like uh, as you get more comfortable and, and get more interested in advanced tooling, it, I don't want to say it becomes irrelevant, but it becomes less important. So I have used it and, and I have not used it. It depends on the project. You want seven minutes? Okay. And tre oh yeah, Trello, it's from, from Roots. Uh, let me do, you have a question? Yes. They're making database changes and you're <coughs> yes. So this is something that um, you kind of learn the hard way, or at least I learned the hard way. That's where we're at right now. So you want to, during the initial conversations for version one, you want to start that, you at least want to queue up that conversation and say, for like, this will either need to be version two or these, these, this milestone will be for version one and what you're requesting totally get totally understand. it has and, and it, but it has to come in version two and you explain to them why and they're pretty receptive to it at least in my experience they understand it's a little hard for them to be like but I don't have the money for that well, I don't have the time for that you know um, I feel like I'm not fully answering your question can you be a little more specific sure in terms of um, work, workflows like you were talking about pushing and pulling databases and stuff, yes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you, is there a way around creating database changes on live, pulling those down, making code changes on dev, and, then just and pushing it back up? Back yeah, up. there's a number of different ways. Um, when it comes to working on a version two, or or even just a one point or one point five, then pulling down the production database and working off of it is one strategy. That's what I generally do. If it's a really large project, and I'm talking about one that's got a massive amount of rows, um, then then the next best thing, and this is just my opinion, is to take um, a portion, like segment the database, and take like maybe the most recent segment, because anything that you're going to be adding after that, the IDs will increment from there and things like that. But at the very least, you can do uh, a freeze of production. And then you do your testing, and you do or you do your development, you do your testing, you bounce back and forth, and then when you're done, you say you push your code. If the database schema has changed, then you would deploy 
the database, but what you would, or, or what you would do is take the database and run a script to go ahead and add the new tables. But since they're going to production and it's a new version, they should be empty. And if they're not, then you may need to either script something to bring in the records or use an importer of some type, depending on what plugin or, or how you're, you know, how you're doing it. Sometimes, I mean, for me, one thing I did have to do is, um, there was one project where they were keeping everything in a spreadsheet and it kept changing, and so I had to write a job, a, a script that would every night um, read the spreadsheet and then do some work and then import that into the database. So it's it, it's not always as easy as when you start from scratch. 